The music of Star Wars has always been one of the most influential things in my life. Since I was very young and listening to the Star Wars NPR radio dramas, I could close my eyes and listen to the different pieces of music and see Star Wars unfolding before my eyes. When I was older, I would buy each of the soundtracks for each film and play them again and again as I relived the universe. Indeed, one could say the music of Star Wars is just as important, if not more so, than the sound effects that populate the world itself. Last week, we went over some of the sounds that populate the Star Wars universe with former LucasArts sound designer David Collins. This week, we're going over the music that moves us through that universe with composer for LucasArts, Jesse Harlan, who has done music for Star Wars Battlefront, Republic Commando, The Old Republic, The Force Unleashed, Star Wars 1313, and more. Even with the lightsaber hums, the blaster bolts, and droids, we need the music, influenced by the all-famous John Williams sound, to take us fully into our journey into the galaxy far, far away. So join us now as we continue our Bombad Radio series on the sound of Star Wars, as we discuss the music of Star Wars, who is none other than composer Jesse Harlan. Whoa, what is this place? Simple. It's the show where we have these guys. This is Catherine Tabor, Padme on Star Wars The Clone Wars. This is the Demon Hunter. Hello, this is Tom Cade, the voice of Professor Utonia. This is Commander Shepard, and Bomb Bad Radio is my favorite podcast on the Citadel. This guy. Hey, kiddos, this is Phantom Jack. Hello, dead people. This is Courtney Taylor. And even this guy. Greetings, Bomb Bad It's a show for the lowers of movies, books, writing, reading, music, dancing, prancing, giggling, teeing, and even trolloloing. We'll sell a penicillin, clear that right up. You shall. All come back. Yes, you all are crazy. <gasps> no! Yes, it's a place where just a little crazy helps us to know and like exactly what you know and love. Welcome to Bomb Bad Radio. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> we have some questions from fans. We have questions from myself, a lot of music lovers here. Uh, last week, we actually had uh, David Collins on to talk about the sound effects side of Star Wars, um, who, as he said, he was your um, wall neighbor for a long time. Yes, that's right. He's a and so, horrible, evil man. No, he's super nice. <laughs> he's a super great guy. We're good. Oh, yeah, we, we love him. And he does some great work on his own shows now, too. Yeah, that's right. Yep, yeah. No, David. David's awesome. D- David's like, I don't know. Maybe the biggest Star Wars fan I've met uh, in in bigger person. than Sam Witwer. Uh, maybe Sam Witwer is bigger. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's that's possible. Um, and so we're going to be discussing more of the music side with you. But one question we have to ask first, just because we asked him the questions that you mentioned. Yes. Um, D- David says we have to ask you about the lyrics to. One of the songs which you actually sent, uh, the lyrics to the Republic Commando theme. Um, well, uh, yeah, they, it's funny, um, there's a, there's a bit of a hidden thing in the lyrics there, um, I mean, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun to work on, uh, Republic Commando, a ton of fun, and, um, and we had, uh, been working on it, and I decided I wanted to do choral stuff, and, uh, particularly male choral stuff, because I wanted it to be, um, um, I wanted the, like, you know, the bravado, the machismo to be in there for the, the clones. And, um, as soon as I realized I wanted to write choral stuff, you know, you run into the problem of what are you going to have them sing? Because, um, you know, it's not earth and you can, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of choirs singing in, um, English, so uh, I wanted something that wasn't um, basic, and uh, so it needed to be something else, and um, so that meant it wasn't going to be Hatties, which is sort of the most fleshed out Star Wars language, so instead we decided to that uh, – I remember going down to David's office at one point. This was um, 
before we had changed uh, buildings with LucasArts, and David was downstairs, and I was on the uh, the upper floor of LucasArts, and I went down to his office, and I said, hey, uh, I want to do choral music. Do you think we could maybe try and make it be Mandalorian? And because I was fairly new to LucasArts at that point, David had been there for a number of years. And Dave was totally just nonchalant about it. I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's give it a try. Let's run it past the licensing folks and see if they'll let us. And they did. <clears throat> and so uh, that was awesome. And um, then the other thing about it is that I – um, my sister is, uh, my kid sister's 13 years younger than me. And, um, I thought it would be fun for her if I worked her name into the lyrics, um, of the game. Um, but I knew that, let's see, at the time I was doing that, she would have been, uh, she would have been 13, I think. And I figured that she didn't have any kind of, um, patience uh, and and um, uh, attention span to actually sit through the game enough to find where I had hidden her uh, her name. So um, I decided that I would make it the very first thing that you heard. And so my sister's name is Cody. And so um, sure enough, the uh, lyrics all open up with the choir just right off the bat, just a gigantic choir of Cody um, as a means of me just sneaking her name into the game um, and, uh, and a, a way of saying hi to her, even though uh, uh, she, she at the time lived uh, on the East Coast and I was out in California. So maybe maybe that is what David wanted me to tell you. I think so, because he started telling me about it. Then he says, no, I need to stop, and he'll tell you the rest. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's that's actually pretty cool. Um, do, you, do you like putting Easter eggs or you know personal stuff into your music by chance? I do. Uh, I love it. Um, uh, there was um, – yeah, I, there's a lot of stuff that I do like that, lots of Easter eggs. There was one, one game I worked on once where I was really frustrated with the audio lead. Um and so I wrote nasty messages uh, to him um, using Morse code that I played on the snare drum in the piece of music. Nobody would ever have any clue what was going on. But uh, if someone were to figure out which piece of music it was and then pull up uh, a Morse code translator, they could probably find my – uh, my nasty messages. Um, IMDb says that Rebel Commando was the first uh, game you composed. Is that true? IMDb is for me mostly missing my credits. Um, okay. When it comes to video games, there is um, a different website that we tend to use as an industry um than IMDb. Uh I a lot of people use IMDb, but but there's another site called Moby Games and Moby Games has my entire um uh b game game uh what what am I trying to say? Gameography. Gameography I guess is the word, yeah. Yeah. Uh no, the first game uh first game I ever worked on was a game called Space Debris and that was a Sony PlayStation, uh, a game for the original Sony PlayStation that only came out in Europe. Um, it was back in 99, I think. Yeah, 1999. Okay, and um, from there, I, I just pulled up Moby Games, and then from there, you worked on Incoming Forces right. before you got into LucasArts Sound Department for Flight of the Falcon. <laughs> right. I don't recall. I, I don't know Flight of the Falcon. Yeah. I, I used to get every game. Yeah, no, Flight of the Falcon was just a, um, uh, a original Game Boy game, I think. And um, I didn't write any music for that. I actually was the um, 
voice of I think it was Luke Skywalker's exertion sounds. So if you play that game and you jump onto a box, you'll hear me going, <laughs> and uh, that was me being apparently Luke Skywalker, I think. <laughs> so as far as composing for Lucas Arts and so on, um, it looks like the first ones would be music editor for Gladius, and then Republic Commando was the first full-on yeah, first full-on game for LucasArts was Republic Commando, although I did write the Gold Guy animation for um, RTX Red Rock. Okay. That was that was the very first thing that I wrote at LucasArts. So I guess we're going to start by talking a little bit more about Republic Commando, yeah. since that's the first full-on you composed. Um, one of the things I know when it comes to people composing Star Wars music, be it the music for Shadows of the Empire, right. be it uh, Kevin Kiner stuff for Clone Wars and so on, is a lot of composers mention how they have a hard time balancing between John Williams and original stuff, because they want an original feel, but at the same time, John Williams is John Williams, right. and he did right. iconic scores. Um, with your first score uh, or soundtrack for Republic Commando, was it intimidating to try to find that balance and just how much you wanted to use of John Williams versus your own stuff? Uh, uh, you know, it wasn't intimidating, but it was a crazy process, I can tell you that. Because when we set out originally to do uh, Republic Commando, there was uh, – the whole team had this idea that we were making the non-Star Wars Star Wars game. It was very dark. It was a lot darker than anything anyone had actually seen from Star Wars yet. Um you have to keep in mind that at this point, episode three had not come out yet, so um, the uh, dark tone that that set, um, nobody had seen anything like it. Um, a lot of the darker stuff that was in the Clone Wars uh, animated series, none of that existed. So um, Everything that anyone had ever seen of Star Wars was um, Jedi and r big, bombastic, romantic swashbuckling. And so here we had a game that was focused on, um, you know, again, there's no Clone Wars cartoon series yet, so at the time... Uh, everyone still had in their minds this sense that stormtroopers were the bad guys, and that still applied sort of to the clones because even you had just seen them marching around at the very end of um, yeah. At the end of the clones, we thought they were the stormtroopers. We thought, hey, look, stormtroopers just around. Yeah, exactly. So you still had this sense that um, you know. When we were when we were developing the game, we still had this sense, this question of how do we make guys who for uh, you know, I forget, let's see, when were we making that? 2004. Or so how do you make guys who were for 30 years the bad guys? How do you suddenly make them the heroes? Um, and so. Uh, so it was the it was the anti Star Wars Star Wars game, and because of that, originally it was like you know we're not going to use a lot of John Williams at all. Um, one of the things that I did was like we knew we wanted some John Williams music in there, but it was very specific uh, in terms of um, anything that we use is going to be. Um, non thematic so um you know the your your listeners all probably know um that the williams scores are full of different themes that all represent different characters and you can basically listen to the score and um in isolation it will tell you the story of what's happening on screen because every time there's a character that's important that's on screen, it's represented by a um, musical theme. But we knew we wanted to get rid of all of that because none of those characters were actually going to appear in the game. Um, there, so uh, the only theme that would remotely be um, applicable would be the Imperial March, 
to represent stormtroopers. But we didn't. But that's a that's so intrinsically related to being the bad guys that we didn't want that to taint our heroic view of the clones in um, in the game. So it was kind of this difficult puzzle to figure out, and and David uh, had the added challenge of um, the same thing on the sound effects side, where you know. He, we wanted to make the like the weapons needed to sound scary, uh, but they couldn't sound um, too unlike Star Wars. So, do you go with the pew pew blasters from the you know where's the line between like ballistic military weapons and the unaltered pure form blaster sound from the films where is where is the right version of it for our game it was the same thing with the music um how much williams do you take out before it doesn't sound like star wars anymore and so there was like you have with all kinds of games there was um focus testing going on um uh, as we were working on the game. And so there was definitely a point where I had been writing a lot of music. It wasn't referencing anything from the films. I was just writing my own stuff. And then, uh, and in fact, not only just writing my own stuff, but going in some pretty different directions with the music because um, all of the, all of the, uh, Republic assault ship levels is it's basically a, a horror score. Um, it's basically a, a haunted house, and there'd never been anything like that Star Wars music wise. So I had to come up with stuff for that, and um, and then the stuff for this all the uh, material that was on Kashyyyk, um, I was using some very untraditional Star Wars instruments like didgeridoos and a lot of um taiko drums uh and uh whatnot so it was it was sounding pretty different um and then we got a uh, some feedback from one of the um uh focus tests that said this doesn't feel like a star wars game and um and so there was a a big sort of panic reaction of like well okay so we need to make it more star wars and one of the easy wins with, with that was let's start putting some more williams back in into it um so then i started picking and choosing and i so i think there are a couple instances of the imperial march that made its way in there uh, i started to bring in the um um the Trade Federation theme for the droids and, and stuff like that. So uh, it did it did uh, eventually find, I think, the right balance. Um, but um, it wasn't it wasn't so much intimidating to figure it out so much as just a, a um, long and um, nuanced problem that we had to solve. And then, of course, that led to, uh, at least on your credit-wise, you know, 2005 was a really busy year, followed by another busy 2006 with Episode Three game, the Battlefront Two, Galaxies, Lego Star Wars, right, um, and so on. Um, so for a lot of these, it says you're an arranger and editing before you, of course, became a music supervisor. Right. Does arranging in this mean you're basically taking John Williams stuff or already established stuff and making the soundtrack to, I know Galaxies being an MMO, you need lots and lots of music for MMOs, as we'll talk later about the current one you're working on. Yeah. Um, so arranging is basically taking already established music and just making it making it work. Um, I would say arranging is mm, the, what you described is is music editing. Um, being an arranger is taking a an existing piece of music and you are creating um, a new presentation of it. Like music editor is taking the actual physical record not physical digital recording of it and chopping it up and rearranging it and you're using what was previously recorded being an arranger is sitting down with a blank piece of music paper and you know writing a new 
I don't know how to word it other than arrangement. Um, you're you're taking the tune, you're taking the chords, you're taking the um, melody, you're changing the instrumentation, you're changing how the song is presented, and then you'll take that and then go and record it. And um, uh, so it's kind of like remixing. So I guess in modern terminology, like how people remix things or combine different songs. Um, to make it their own? Yeah, uh, yeah, but it would have to be like, um, let's see, what's a good example? So, um, and a, let, let's, okay, let's put it this way. An arrange, an arranger is, if I, if I were to, um, write out and record a new version of, um, Jingle Bells. Uh, I'm not the writer of Jingle Bells, but I would be the arranger of it, right? Because the song already exists, but I am presenting it in a new way um, and and putting that out there into the world a new way. So if we can still understand exactly what you're making, like if you made a new version of Imperial March, as long as we know it's still the Imperial March, that's an arrangement of it versus – um, actually, uh, actually, um, right. Composing it yourself. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The song is written by John Williams, and then uh, you know, if I were to do a new version, you know, write up a new version of the Imperial March, I'd be an arranger. So as long as it's recognizable, it's an arranger. Yeah. Yep. That's right. So um, we're gonna jump a little bit because you worked a lot over, you know, for several years on editing, implementation, yep. uh, arranging, and so on with Lego Star Wars and so on. Um, one question a fan has is, what are the challenges you face when you have, say, a Lego Star Wars game where you have to have it work on, you know, the Wii, on the PlayStation, on Xbox, and so on, with different levels of sound quality? Do you have to deal that with, deal with that yourself? We you have to be able to arrange it so the sound is different in each one. Um, I know with Force, Un Force Unleashed. They had to do lots of different versions, or is yeah. this something that's done by someone else? Uh, a lot of the times it was done by us uh, specifically, yeah. Um, with something like um, – something like Gladius, um, we had to – we were only going to do one set of audio assets because uh, – time was a restraint and so what you ended up doing was working to the lowest uh common denominator unfortunately so uh for gladius i think that was the gamecube um it it was the one that um could hold the least amount of sounds and so therefore we had to work towards that um with the force unleashed uh, the game came out on a ton of different platforms. It was on um, PlayStation 2? PlayStation 3? Uh, PlayStation 3. PlayStation yeah. 3 and, and PlayStation PSP. 2. And PSP and Xbox and a yeah, ton of stuff. And my Wii version that looks very different and plays different than the rest of them. Right. Like. So <laughs> with that... Um, LucasArts had hired a – so LucasArts was doing its own version of The Force Unleashed, and then we also had a, um, a an Australian company that we uh, hired called uh, – I just had the name, and now it, I'm – Chrome, uh, Chrome Studios. And Chrome was working on the development of the um, PS2 and uh, Wii versions of the game. And the relationship we had with Chrome was one that would continue for a number of years. Uh, they worked on a bunch of um, Clone Wars titles. And um, so while they were doing a lot of the um, implementation and sound uh, work, we actually ended up um, – doing uh so that they was started off originally they were going to be doing most of it and we were going to just focus on our thing things changed and we ended up doing a lot of their uh their game as well we were doing uh both games simultaneously so if you um so if you've played both versions i you know uh i edited all the cutscene music um 
which is a combination of Mark Grisky's original score and John Williams' music from the films. So the version, the PS3 versions, those were all edited by me, and then the um, and then Chrome would send us their cutscenes, and I would edit all of their cutscene music as well. Um, it was we basically just did two games simultaneously to to get that stuff done. David Collins was doing mixes for them, and and um, giving them tons of feedback on their implementation, lots of mix notes, um, weapon design, all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I was doing, um, I was editing music, music loops for them for all the in-game stuff. I was um, editing their cutscene sound effect, or um, cutscene music. Um, yeah, we did. And then I think even, um, I think I even ended up doing some of the music editing on, there was like a there was a there was a mobile version of TFU if I can rem if I remember correctly I don't remember who did it um, might have been THQ or somebody um, but I think I even did the some of the music editing for that uh, or all of the music editing for that I don't remember but yeah uh, to 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 the point of the question frequently we did all of the um, all of the different platforms and we had to do all of them pretty differently because like you said the tfu on ps2 played very differently and had a lot of different story elements and stuff that weren't in the um uh the ps3 version and so we yeah we had to do a lot of different things uh depending on what the platform was as far as the force unleashed goes i'm oh, sorry my son just woke up but as far as force unleashed goes uh you were the Supervisor, arranger, and you composed the theme right. while Mark did the original score. Right. Right. Okay. Yep, that's right. Yeah, we had a ton of different things going on at the same time in in LucasArts at that point. Um, LucasArts had three teams um, going on at one time. There was uh, internally we were working on the Force Unleashed. We were working on. Um, Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings. Um, we were working on uh, Fracture. We had a, a mobile um, team. I, I guess at the, no, it wasn't called mobile at the time. They were our handheld team, and all of these different teams were all being serviced by the sound department. Um, and so we were working on tons of different things, and. Um, my favorite stuff to do, like you mentioned, because you you know um, you want to have your own voice uh, when you're a composer. My favorite stuff to work on was the original IP stuff, and um, so I originally was going to be working on the music for Fracture while the other stuff was being developed, and um, so that's why I tapped Mark to do the music for The Force Unleashed so that I could work on uh, Fracture. Um, and uh, then things changed and I wasn't working on Fracture and Mark was already doing TFU. So then I was just uh, supervising on TFU. And because that answers a fan question, because they wanted to know how come you worked on The Force Unleashed 1, but Force Unleashed 2 seems to be void of you beyond the theme. I mean, um, I mean because Mark was doing the score, I'm assuming. Yeah, it's, basically it was, you know, uh, once, once Mark did TFU 1, then I wanted to make sure that he was able to come back and do TFU 2. Um, and, and, and I wasn't even originally – supposed to do even the theme on TFU1, um, but um, it was just a thing where Mark um, Mark was working on it, and Mark had done a number of different versions of, of themes for the game, but none of them were just quite right, and, um, and the team was starting to get really uh, antsy, particularly um, uh, Hayden Blackman, who's the, the project lead, um, and it was this like there was this stressful thing of like uh we need a theme and we need it like now and 
Um, and there was so it just happened that eventually I was like, okay, everybody, go go to lunch, and I will write something over lunch. And uh, when you come back, you'll have a theme. You wrote it over lunch? Yeah, I wrote it over lunch. Wow. Yeah. So you already had something in your head, I'm assuming. No, I had nothing in my head. Um, I had a concept that the theme I, – what I knew I wanted the theme to sound like was a theme that was in two parts. It needed to be um, sorrowfully heroic, tragically heroic. Um, it needed You needed to feel heroic, but it also needed to have this – real kind of pain inside that heroism that needed to be the first part of it and then the second half needed to be just the pure unadulterated darkness that is in star killer and that was what i wanted the theme to be those two things um and that and i knew that I knew that's what I was looking for, and uh, so everybody went away to lunch, and I sat down and and uh, sat down at the piano and came up with um, came up with a a sketched out version of the theme that is very close to what it ended up being in the final version. So I sent it off to Mark, and and Mark orchestrated it. I think over the afternoon and by the next morning the finished version of the theme was was ready to go so he was pleased with the theme that you sent him was he or, or was he just okay I'll do this or? no he was he was pleased um i think well, he was pleased mostly because the because hayden was pleased um and so that meant that um it just was no longer a, a stressor for everybody um, and so, you know, when you have approval of the team and, and approvals can be difficult on game teams because it's, uh, you have a whole bunch of people you have to please. And it's not just, um, it's not just you and like one person making decisions. It can frequently be you and like a boardroom full of people and, um, making sure that everybody's happy is not not the easiest thing in the world. So uh, we tend to call it um, creativity by committee and it's not easy. So when, when the team, when you get word that the team is happy with something, that's great. You just, you, you just move forward with it. And, and so when, when Mark found out, you know, everybody's happy with the theme. Uh, now let's just start weaving it into the score. Mark was like, great, let's just do it. it sounds good to me. Let's go. And uh, and it was it's pretty late in the process too, so that's why the theme doesn't appear throughout much of TFU one. But then when we did TFU two, uh, Mark weaved the theme, the, the main TFU theme, through a lot more of the score. Um, and yeah, that's uh, I think that's pretty much how it went down. So one question from a fan is. Um, in a game like Force Unleashed or Hello Commando, how much original music is actually written? Like, how long is the actual original soundtrack that you guys write? I wrote 85 minutes of music on Republic Commando. And then for TFU, Mark wrote an hour. And I think TFU 2, he wrote another hour. And it really, it can, it can depend. It, it changes depending on, on the game and the scope and uh, whatnot. Something like um, The Old Republic. Um <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot. Yeah, we when it launched, we had written seven hours of original music for it, and now that it post-launch, uh, there has been uh, probably another um, maybe it's co probably coming up on two hours worth of material that's been written for it.
Well, with, like, the Old Republic, which I guess we'll get into now, and, you know, Star Wars Galaxy, which you worked on, since it's an MMO that can take possibly hundreds and hundreds of hours, if you don't have a lot of music, you people will get really bored hearing the same song over and over again. Like, yeah, Bruce, you, you remember that game? <laughs> so it's like, it's like when I was playing Galactic Battlegrounds, which I like the music, but there's half an hour of music. So after a while, you can, like, you can just hum every theme as it comes on because you know exactly the order it's going to do it. Right. And if I did that in the Old Republic, it would, I don't know, it'd probably drive me nuts. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's true. It's the biggest problem um, is is listener fatigue, um, and uh, and Bioware Austin they are the ones that are implementing the music for um, uh, the Old Republic, and and I know that they frequently get requests from people. Um, why don't you put in an option for continuous music and, and stuff like that? But I think that they are intentionally trying to throttle that back so that people don't get completely bored of uh, just hearing the same stuff over and over again. Um, it's tough. It's, it's, it's the hardest part of, of doing an MMO is, is the concept of listener fatigue. Um, there's just uh, – I don't know that there's a way to avoid it. How many of you composed music for the Old Republic, or is it mainly just you? Um, when we started out, there were five composers doing orchestral music. It was um, myself, Mark Grisky, uh, Gordy Hab, Lenny Moore, and Wilbert Roger II. Um, Will and I were both on staff at LucasArts, um, and then I brought in Mark and Gordy who had – Gordy had done um, the uh, Staff of Kings score for us for the Wii um, and uh, a couple of other different things. And then Lenny was someone that I had known for a long time that I wanted to, to work with. So um, brought those three guys in to work with Will and I on the orchestral side of things. And then um, – uh, and then there was the whole other side of it, which was the cantina band music, um, which had three composers on it. Um, it was um, Peter McConnell, who was the lead on it, um, who had worked he, – he, he's uh, an older uh, – he's, he's one of the original LucasArts um, music department guys. Uh, he did the um, – he did the soundtrack for Grim Fandango most famously um, and tons of other things for them and uh, has since gone on to do a bunch of really great stuff with the Sly Cooper games and Psychonauts and Brutal Legend and Broken Age and all those things. So um, Peter's got this amazing quirky style and so I knew that he was the perfect guy to do the cantina music. So, uh, so I brought on Peter to do that and then um, he had help from um, Jared Emerson Johnson, who does a lot of work with Telltale and, um, and and their games, the Tales of Monkey Island stuff and The Walking Dead and whatnot. And then another guy that Peter knew, um, who's a composer named Steve Kirk. So that was uh, five of us on the orchestral stuff and then the three guys on the cantina stuff. And I noticed that with the Old Republic, the main theme this time was done by Mark rather than you. The Clash of Destiny, I believe, is considered the main theme. Yeah, no, it's true. Um, although, that said, um, the way that that worked out, um, Mark, myself, and Wilbert actually all wrote themes for the game. Um, and submitted them to Bioware and said to them, uh, and um, because it was the same sort of thing. Bioware was not quite happy with um they, like they didn't have they didn't have a theme that they were really thrilled with yet and so we got to a point where Wilbert myself and Mark all submitted themes to them and they picked one of the three um the one that I submitted is one that's been used a lot in, in some of the marketing stuff um it's called um the name I have for it is a shaking of the mountain um, but that was my take on a main theme for the, the game.
I've noticed in a lot of your stuff, especially in the Old Republic, um, with a lot of your themes and a lot of your, your scores, you like using choirs. Um, is there a reason why you like? I, I love the choirs. I love hearing that in soundtracks. Is there a reason why you like implementing choirs in your stuff? Um, you know, I think that it's. I think that it's uh, it's mostly due to the fact that a choir, vocals in general, adds a lot of humanity into the sound. Um, there's something about an orchestra that is extremely expressive and extremely powerful, but suddenly when you add choir to it, it just gets that much more intimate. Um, and there's a whole range of sounds that just aren't possible with instruments alone. And so the choir just it, – it's like, it's like taking the, um, the top down on a convertible. You just open it up, and suddenly there's a ton more possibilities for what you're able to do. Um, it, it also is probably due to the fact that my main instrument is voice. So um, – when I was studying throughout college, um, th I was singing all the time, singing in bands, singing in choirs. Um, it's uh, something that I just know very well and have a, a real love for. One question I have then is, um, with previous composers that we've talked to, especially if we do game ones, very few of them ever get to record with actual instruments or actual voices. How, how much of your work have you been able to record with actual instruments and actual singers to uh enhance the, the sound from what the synth can do. Yeah, um, I would say I've been lucky, um, and it's been a fair amount, especially my time at, at LucasArts. Um, Republic Commando, I got to record a male choir for that, which was great. I got to record a number of um, live instruments. I remember there was a – Mark Grisky was originally a staff composer at LucasArts, and he and I were both – there at the same time when I was working on Republic Commando. And, and so there was a period of time, there was a, like two nights or something on the recording for Republic Commando where Mark and I rented a whole bunch of percussion instruments from a local um, percussion rental place and just piled them all into our recording studio at work and we just sampled all kinds of stuff and and um, so that was a great experience and then I recorded uh, we had a uh, an in, a summer intern in the audio department who played didgeridoo and so I put him in front of a mic and the, and he played live didgeridoo for me and I then took that and used that throughout the score and then uh, you know throughout what we've worked on um we we were very lucky that we got a lot of live recording with really phenomenal musicians i mean once we got to the force unleashed and we were starting to record with um members of the San Francisco Symphony and San Francisco Opera Orchestras uh up at Sky Sound on the main stage that was incredible um, recording over in um, England at Abbey Road for uh, music for the Old Republic. Um, I recorded stuff for the uh, unfortunately ill-fated Star Wars 1313 uh, at, at Abbey Road. Um, I've been very lucky. There have been a lot of things that I've been able to do with live players. And even on s much smaller things like the uh, Monkey Island Special Edition game, um, I made sure that uh, there were as many live instruments as possible. And I lucked out because basically the audio department at the at the time was full of guys who just could play all kinds of different instruments. So I sort of just took stock of what instruments everybody kind of knew and arranged the music around what was available to me. So, you know, and 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 everybody knew that I was doing this. And so one guy in particular, a uh, sound designer uh, named Aaron Brown, he just loved collecting instruments. Sometimes you'll meet musicians who are like that. They Maybe they don't know how to play a trumpet, but they decide to just buy one off of Craigslist and they'll start learning how to play it. So Aaron had tons of instruments. And I remember there was a time where he went away on vacation and he came to Hawaii and he came back and he came in the first day back and he said, I bought a ukulele. And I said, 
awesome, grab it. We're going to go record it for um, uh, Monkey Island. And so it was, it was just like that. It was any time I could get anybody in front of a microphone, um, I, I would use it to my advantage. But I try and do that in general, even now that I'm not at, at LucasArts. I try and record as many live things as I can. Budgets are very frequently um, – prohibitive to that, but I'll try and at least sweeten things with one live instrument or a couple live instruments or, you know, it, anything I could do myself, I'll do. If, if it, something needs hand claps, I'll stick a mic up and record hand claps instead of using samples. It's that sort of stuff. So one thing I, I have noticed, um, we'll get back to the public in just a second, is you like to try lots of different styles. Yeah. Uh, just from your samples alone, like you have, you, know, you have lots of the choir stuff, you have the full orchestration, you have almost ambient music. Yep. Um, you also have, uh, like, the song which, you know, I, I quite like and my son likes is it puts him to sleep and calms him down, the the, the Roku uh, Tukotamba uh -huh. um, from, I believe, that's from Lego Star Wars 3, right? Well, yes, it was originally for another game, um, and uh, the game got... Um, canceled after the whole score had been written the game was basically done there was used to be this small group at lucas arts called team three and team three was working on small uh new ip and the two things to come out of team three team three did the special edition version of monkey the first monkey island game and then moved on from that to do a very small little game called lucidity and then started work on a bunch of other different things and one of those things was a game that basically was finished and the team had asked me to write a soundtrack of brazilian trip hop which um I loved the challenge of trying to figure out, so I was listening to a lot of Bossa Nova and a lot of Portishead and stuff like that. Um, and then the game got canceled, and everybody was super bummed. And uh, at the same time, I was working on editing the cutscenes for um, Lego Star Wars uh, Clone Wars. And unfortunately... Everything that whole soundtrack was dead, and I was so bummed because I thought I was so proud of it, and no one was ever going to hear it. But then all of a sudden, there was this one cutscene where there's a, a uh, Anakin is trying to get a hold of a clone trooper, and when it cuts to the cockpit of the clone trooper, the clone trooper is supposed to not be able to hear Anakin because he's listening to the radio really loudly, and we didn't have anything that would be like comedic enough to be totally out of place for him to be listening to in the cockpit. And then I suddenly realized like, oh wait, I can put Rakatukatambo in there because it's completely out of character for anything. And so it'll like the comedic value of, you know, this guy's in the middle of a war scene, but he's hanging out in his cockpit, listening to a bossa nova tune. So technically that song appears for all of about maybe three seconds in uh, Lego Star Wars, The Clone Wars, but it was actually written for another game that got canceled. It is supposed to be Bossa Nova because my, my wife and I are actually in a discussion this morning on what it is, and she thought it was a we, – we figured it was too slow for a samba, but she thought it was a mamba when I said it was Bossa Nova. It, it, is it Bossa Nova? Yeah, I – you know, it's – again, it's probably a little too fast for a Bossa Nova, but that's what I – I would consider it a fast bossa nova. You're right. It's too slow for a samba, definitely. Uh, I would go with bossa nova, I guess. Yes, I would. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you also, um, final one of your games, I believe you're working on it now. Is, Counter is the Counter Spy one you're working on now? No, Counter Spy is done. It, it was released back in August. I actually finished up the score to that about a year ago. So uh, how long before the game comes out do you actually do the score for the most part? Because I know Old Republic and so on is 
you know, a bit different manner. Well, for a counter spy, for Force Unleashed, and so on. In an ideal case, how long before the game is done do you want your score in? Counter spy is a very different beast. Uh, it's probably the only game I've ever worked on where the music was the very first thing done on the game. Um, and I think I was done about. 10 months before the game was finished, and that's just unheard of to me. Um, most of the time, it's like you're working down to the wire uh, with everybody else, and that's due in part to the fact that, especially if it's a story-based game, cutscenes are the absolute last thing that anybody ever delivers, and um, so you're dependent on the rest of the team finishing things like that before you can actually plug them in. So a lot of the time you're dependent upon people figuring out the gameplay, you're dependent upon people building the level design, you're dependent upon people uh, creating the cutscenes. Music chases all of those things. And so um, what frequently will happen is the game will start, there'll be a period of time where they're concocting the main ideas for what the game will be. Um, it's, it's too early to even call that pre-production. Um, and then once they enter pre-production, music comes in in order to help them establish some prototypes, in order to figure out what the game is going to sound like in order to sell the idea of the game to executives by way of um, either animatics that um, are, you know, non-interactive, uh, just movies that are hints of what the game will eventually look like, or maybe it's actual prototype levels that have interactive music implemented within it. Um, but then music kind of lays out for a while because you've got to wait for people to actually build stuff. So uh, depending on how tight the time period is, there could be a couple months where I'm maybe not actually working on anything with them. Um, or if it's a tighter schedule and I know exactly what I need to be doing, uh, I I'll just go ahead and start producing music and kind of, catch up with them later once they've built enough for me to actually be able to work together. So um, music is dependent upon the rest of the game. Counter Spy was a little different because um, the score is unique in that it's not a lot of looping music. It's certainly not wall-to-wall -wall music. It's mostly comprised of small stingers, little 15 to 30 second pieces of music. And um, so it was easy for me to just crank those things out and then hand those to the, de to the development team. And then they were able to implement those wherever they wanted them and use them as little pieces of coloration. Uh, it wasn't something where it was, um, you know, I needed to intrinsically know what was happening with all of the level design in order to be able to compose. So here's another fan question. I'm not quite sure how accurate this person's assumptions are. <laughs> but here's, here's what he says. It says, you got to work on the last LucasArts projects with the Old Republic, Connect Star Wars, Angry Birds Star Wars. Were you by chance also going to be doing the score for Star Wars 1313 before it got canceled? was. Yes, I was. I had written about a half hour's worth of music for the game. Um, I had scored the everything that was up on the E3 um, – uh, presentation that was being given. It was, I was having a lot of fun with it. It was, again, another, uh, another thing much like Republic Commando that was sort of the non-Star Wars, Star Wars game. Because much like 
you know, with Republic Commando, where you were focusing on heroes that, that weren't traditionally heroes, and you were in environments that we hadn't seen a lot of before, uh, 1313 was going to be the same way. It was focused on bounty hunters, and it was set in the center of Coruscant, which no one had ever seen before. And so um, it was a very different score. Um, I was using a lot of um, different textures. I was using a lot of – I was actually using some electronic textures. I was using um, – I was doing things like running cellos and basses through guitar distortion pedals and, and uh, experimenting a fair amount with a lot of stuff because I really wanted to make you feel like a badass. Um, and uh, it was coming together pretty well. I was also uh, – one of the things we were trying to do, um, we were working on this idea of uh, a living world. So there was going to be a lot of what's called source music in the score, which means music that um, – like you get source music a lot in games like – uh, Grand Theft Auto source music is music that yeah when the, when your radio is on and you hear that yeah music that lives scene. within the world right so um, anything coming out of a TV anything coming out of a car radio that's source music so I was actually writing a bunch of source music for the center of Coruscant um, and it was everything from stuff that sounded like bizarre alien um, dance club music uh, because we had dance clubs. Not that you could go in them, but you you know you would walk by and there'd be a bouncer standing outside, and so we had this like big crazy booming uh, dance club music coming out ambiently into the world. Um, we attached music onto speeders so that while you're platforming around on buildings, all of a sudden a car would or not a car a speeder would fly past you and you would just hear like you know that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, we had some street musicians that we were, um, putting around the world or, um, m one of the weirder things I was working on before, right before the game got canceled, I was actually writing, um, Hattie's gangster rap tune, um, where I had come up with this idea for a protocol droid who got, uh, electrocuted and had a personality fault and suddenly thought that he was um, like, you know, whatever the uh, – like the – like Tupac of Star Wars. Yeah, more like more like the Eminem of Star Wars, like just super bold, brazen uh, personality, just a complete braggart. And um, so uh, I was writing Hattie's rap um, – and it was – amazingly, it was working. <laughs> it sounded good. So is this a, a sound – is this music that we'll, you think we'll ever get to hear, or is it pretty much just yeah. beyond what we got in those trailers? It's gone forever. Gone forever. Sad. Maybe you could sneak some of it into the Old Republic soundtrack. I, I have talked to Bioware about it, and they can't because of the way rights usage uh, stuff works out. So it's gone forever, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, one thing you were, I mean, you were talking about the this, this soundtrack for 1313, one thing it reminds me of, um, that comes to mind, does, John Williams uh, had a song in Attack of the Clones when they're chasing, um, when Obi-Wan's chasing the bounty hunter through, uh, through Coruscant, we have the guitar coming in right. and so on, is that sort of like a base for what you were going after, or is it a different sort of sound? No, it was a very different sound. Um, that was, I, I have to say, I find that one to be a weird cue. I mean, I love the cue, I just, the guitar is weird. And I think that they eventually decided the guitar was weird too, because the guitar is in the, it's on the soundtrack, but it's not in the film. Um, they've muted it once you actually get into the film mix. Um, and, uh... Yeah, no, this was this was a lot lower. Um not a lot of like it wasn't lead guitar type stuff. It was it was low like these big deep swells of of French horns and trombones and we were actually using um contrabass trombones. So like trombone's pretty low. Then there's bass trombone and then we were also using contrabass trombones, which is just this amazingly deep growling sound 
and um, so a lot of and so what I would do is I had these big swells that would just sort of sound like a growl of like raw and when I would do that it would be these like big deep brass sounds mixed with cellos and basses at the very bottom of their register and then to give it some added grit and dirt I was running the cellos and basses through uh, distortion pedals as well. Wow, those are that, that's a really rare instrument to use. Um, I guess uh, one, we'll do two more questions and because we have to wrap it up. Uh, so uh, one of them is, what is a, either your what is your favorite weird instrument to use, or what is a weird instrument that you w- that you really want to use that you have not gotten to use yet in one of your scores? Uh, that's a great question. Um, favorite weird instrument to use? I seem to have this fixation on wanting to use. A mouth harp on scores. I finally did it once, uh, and it worked really well. But it, mouth harp is, is it goes by a lot of different names. Um, jaw harp. It's it's this thing uh, that you sit against your teeth and you flick it with your thumb, and it's like bang 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 bang. bang. Um, but like that's one way to play it, and you get this this very comedic kind of boinging sound. But there's another way to play it, which is fascinating to me, where you breathe in and out really quickly through it. And it, there's just nothing else that sounds like it, as far as I'm concerned. It's this n- really awesome, like, <laughs> kind of sound. It's amazing. And I- I've never, I've never found a place where I could use it yet, but I will. <laughs> I just need to find the right score for it. My wife actually has a has a quick question now that she heard that. Hey, so I'm a percussionist, so I was just wondering if um, this is my favorite thing I've ever done with percussion. Have you ever used an upside down cymbal on a timpani played with a bow? Yeah, um, with a bow, not with a bow. Um, I've used a fair amount of. Um, Timpani with on cymbal. In fact, um, I just wrote um, I just wrote a bunch of music for Yavin Four for the Old Republic, and there's a whole bunch of like mysterious sort of swampy, not swampy, but that more of a more of a how I was thinking of it, not uh, not what the levels like, but. Um, just just like murky murky is the right word for it a murky sort of sound and so i wanted to have a lot of the um symbol on timpani with these big pitch glissandos and whatnot but i haven't used a bow that's interesting um that's actually a new one to me i hadn't heard that you could do that that's cool i'll have to try that now that makes it really cool kind of like space invader type sound nice yeah, I'll, yes. I'll have to check that out. That sounds awesome. So uh, last question is just going to be, um, where can people, if they want people want to ask you more questions, since I'm quite sure they'll have more, and we'll probably have to have you on again because there's so much more I can talk about music-wise. But if people have more que- have questions, they want to get in contact with you, if they want to hear your music yeah. and uh, realize that jesseharland.net is not you. <laughs> jesseharland.net uh, is not me. Where can they get your stuff and contact you and ask questions and so on? Yeah, there are two Jesse Jesse C. Harlands, and both of them are game developers, and both of them do music, um, which is can be very confusing, I would imagine. Um, no, uh, jesseharland.net is not me. I am at dunderpatemusic.com, D-U-N-D-E-R, P-A-T-E music.com and you will be right there on the front. You'll find my um, SoundCloud playlist for my most recent version of my demo. Uh, You can also find Dunderpaint Music on SoundCloud where I have a bunch more stuff. Um, And then there's a Dunderpaint Music page on Facebook and Dunderpaint Music on Twitter and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm around. You can find me. Wow, let's give a big round of applause for Jesse Harlan, the man behind so much of the music that we know and love in our Star Wars video games. But if you guys love that 1313 discussion there, why don't we have an exclusive clip from the 1313 score written by Jesse Harlan that, as he said, we will never see in any other way. So here's an exclusive clip from the score of Star Wars 1313.
Okay, folks, that is it, I promise you. We went a little bit long, but how could we not? This has been fantastic. Thank you, Jesse, for giving us such an awesome look into the making of Star Wars music. Because, as we know, there's the John Williams, Masterpieces, Kevin Kiner with Clone Wars and Rebels. And then there's all these people from Margetsky and so on uh, who make the music for the games. And we play the games a lot. And, uh, Jesse, you've been part of Battlefront, you've been part of Republic Commando, Force Unleashed, Duel Republic, Lego Star Wars, so much awesomeness. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we hope to have you on again in the future. Um, of course, the music from this, if you guys haven't noticed, the music for this has been from Jesse Harlan. We had the Force Unleashed team, we had uh, Republic Commando, we had some of his stuff from Counter Spy, we had two songs from the Old Republic, and uh, we had his little piece there from 1313. And of course, the song that is playing now, our show music is called True Strength, it is by John Dreamer. I know, I love it. I've, I've heard lots of great comments from you guys uh, that you all love it too, so thank you. Thank you. I, I, it's a compliment to him, and uh, I, I'm glad that we found a piece that everyone loves. Um, so, of course, if you want to follow Bombard Radio, you can find us on Facebook at Bombard Radio, on Twitter at Bombard Radio, Stitcher at Bombard Radio, iTunes at Bombard Radio, not Radio Foo Bar, if you remember. Um, also, our blog, bombardradio.blogspot.com, or you can email us at bombardradio at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. We'd love to hear what you think. Next week, we have an awesome treat, which we'll be hinting at stuff as we go. It's going to be our radio drama, a dream of mine since I was six years old. We're going to continue our Sounds of Star Wars series with a radio drama. We've learned about the sound effects, we've learned about the music, and now we're going to see how the heck Bombard Radio does in making a radio drama. Uh, um, I am nervous. I'm uh, editing it as we speak, and I hope... I hope it turns out as, as good as I hope and as you guys do. This week we'll hopefully we'll release some clips or some uh, stuff from the cast. The cast is all amateur. We've all been working really hard and I hope you guys enjoy it and give, uh, give your thoughts. But uh, of course that's next week. That'll be on November 8th. So uh, yeah, part two of Sounds of Star Wars is now done. Thank you so much for enjoying the show. Please leave us a comment. Please leave us reviews. And but of course, but as always... So long, and thanks for all the fish.